to take issue with the screen size, or the text size, I should say. So the first thing I want to say, um, after just printing these out, that I meant to do without the last line on the wild cards, just cross out that line. I would appreciate that. And then the last line on the wild cards on the right, bottom right. And then with a little less um, Video, uh, little else video. So I want to say that this session is going to be about um, a little more geared towards if you're familiar with some of the commands and using them more productively, more um, making the shell more convenient for yourself. Um, and a little bit, especially in the beginning, what the hell is actually going on. So I've been using command prompt and shell kind of interchangeably today and yet at uh, Monday. Um, I'd like to actually go into, well, first of all, what the um, different shells are. So uh, after doing, so here's a little outline. I want to make a point. I'm going to say a lot of things are really convenient to do in the shell. And then towards the end, say why um, or how to make that permanent. So uh, Leslie had a question last time, how to make the LS, um, how to make LS always shows colors. I'll show you how to do that today. So, and a couple of useful tricks depending on time. So, I want to go over what shells exist, partly because in the field I'm in, um, there is a shell that's still in use, that's not used much, in use much anymore, and it, when you get familiar with a lot of Linux systems, and especially other Unix systems, um, there's quite a bit of diversity, quite a bit of diversity extending back a couple decades. So, in the beginning, well, there were, the beginning, there were shells created by the creators of Unix. And towards the end of the 70s, there were two shells that became um, standardized because AT&T gave them out and because the, the uh, educational institutions used them. The Lorne shell and the C shell. The C shell was very innovative for interactive features, some of which we'll talk about today. The Born shell was the first shell to in wide production that you could use like a programming language. So while so not just running commands, but also doing while loops, doing um, if statements. C shell took this and made it a little more um, friendly to use. You could do some keystrokes and get your history back. Um, so the seashell was written by uh, actually a graduate student, Bill Joy, towards the end of the 70s. And it was used a lot um, among the Berkeley flavors of Unix. Later on, when AT&T commercialized, the corn shell was introduced uh, as like a taking all the nice things about seashell and doing them in this really crazy syntax that the born shell had. Born shell. If you're familiar with doing if statements or while loops or for loops in um, C or Perl or Python or PHP, Born Shell looks nothing like those. It actually looks really convoluted, um, which was an advantage of the C shell. It makes more sense looking at it, kind of. TCSH added some, added some features. And nowadays, for I don't know how long, probably uh, decades at this point, no one uses the born shell or seashell anymore. We will say we use the seashell. 
but we're really using TCSH, which is completely compatible with C-Shell, except adding some more features. Um, later on, Born Again Shell was supposed to be a free version of the Born Shell with all these nice features, and that is by far the most common. That is by far the most common in this room, for sure, uh, as well as Linux, Macs, uh, many of these use Bash. Born again as a pun. So, uh, really, the only place that where seashell is still common was the things dependent on of uh, the educational institutions. And then there's a couple alternatives today that I won't talk about. But seashell and fish are kind of interesting in their own rights. Fish is supposed to be really friendly, um, powerful features, just on by default and breaking the born shell compatibility. So I'm going into all this history because I want to get across that almost always you will see bash. And sometimes, in some places, you will see seashell. And the fundamental things that you manipulate how you use the shell are different. And if you want to use these for programming, they're very different. So if you want to program in your shell, um, you're going to be compatible with one of these two. Or you're compatible with born shell, which means you're compatible with ash and corn. And I mentioned this because seashell is still used in astronomy, unfortunately, and, other, and some other fields, uh, but dwindling amount of fields. The reason this is bad is because the seashell was written in such a way that you can't really um, make sense of the language without running through it. So in a, well, in a language like English, you can break it up into sentences and words. In seashell, you can't really tell what the structure of it is until you run it. Um, this is called an ad hoc processor, as opposed to having something that you can um, parse into words or tokens. Uh, this causes a lot of um, issues that make it kind of very difficult to predict how you program it. Um, and there's confusing things about it. There's limited features um, that, just a little quotes. So I've been asked how to change a default shell to C shell, or TCSH, really. Um, not a good idea, but there's some code still using it. So keep that in mind, some code still requiring it. So some so the commands here I'll try to I've tried to make work in both. Actually, for this so I can actually tell, so I can tell which one I'm in. Bash at the very beginning of typing help will tell you what version it is. C shell, if I run it, or TSCH has no help commands. And it confusingly sets the shell variable to bash. Yeah. But I'll explain why that's confusing. So I'm using bash up here. Astro1 may be using C shell. I don't know, does the help command work for you guys? It does. Good. The first line of help should tell you what version of the shell you're using. Um, So, oh, um, one, one of the fundamental things that um, C shell added in later shells used heavily um, is the ability to redirect, to redirect your output and inputs. So let's say I run ls. I see some folders. 
I could say this. I could type ls and put the output in some fold in some file listing of folder. And if I type ls again, I have a new file. And the cat command displays it. LS changes its output when it knows you're going to a file. Um, this works with any any command that gives us something so th that outputs text to what's called standard outputs. So if I do file listing a folder, I just get what type it is, and that's an ASCII file. I could do the um, angle bracket to send it to another file, and it still works. So if you're running a long that command that's going to take a long time, I'll put a lot of text. It's really useful to save the output um, to a file. This is uh, in both Bash, uh, Bash and C shell. Another example. So another thing you can do, and it has a nice um, has a nice symbolism. If you have a command that takes things that you type in. So for instance. I didn't talk about this last time, but the awk command is actually designed for formatting reports. You will almost never use it like that, because um, that is actually a really complicated usage of it. Awk is a very, sorry, wrong bracket. Awk is a very, um, it's a full programming language that's meant to be used at the command line. Um, well, they could write full scripts based on it. And what it does is it goes through line by line and does something to the output. Um, formats it, specifically, is what it's designed for. So in this case, what this line does, and I had this on, my, on the cheat sheet from last time, it prints the second column, print any column, you get if statements in here, loops, um, and whatnot. And I can do that, let's say I have a file I, I know has um, columns. So I'm typing slash etc, slash, and I'm doing double, double uh, tab to see my list. And looking at these files, actually, let's do nano rc, because I believe everyone except the people using Siglin has, has nano. So this would be weird because the comp, it's not actually separated in the columns, so some of them will be empty, and this won't make much sense. If I use less on nano RC, you can see what it did was the um, first word after these asterisk after these um, pound signs. It thinks of as the second column. Actually, the, the first word, sorry, the second word here, including the pound signs as words, is what it printed out. So here are the second words of, of, of all the um, lines of that file. It also, it can read from the keyboard. So if I do, one, two, three, four. Hello there. C Jack Run. It does the second word of each, or the second column. It's I'm doing input and it's giving me output. <coughs> and control D gets you out of this. If I have my own Input for it. Off takes the file name, 
but if I wanted, I could make it treat the file as though I'm typing on the keyboard with the angled bracket. So it shows the same result as if I typed it out, um, line by line. So this is actually really useful um, when you have, uh, sometimes, when you have commands that don't really take files as arguments, but they still want you to type something. The yes command, which I do not recommend running, or if you do run, um, be prepared to press Control C to exit it. Yes just prints out a bunch of whys. So if you have a program that keeps asking you questions, um, you could put the output of yes into a file and then feed that file. <laughs> Although you have to tell yes to stop at some point. Um, so that kind of very easy to script manipulation of programs is key to, how you, to, to Unix. Um, so you can treat running commands like running functions in, or executing functions in a programming language. And that's actually a lot of how a lot of design of the shell goes. In Bash, you can go a little deeper into how programs are designed. So this is only for Bash, not C shell. Um, the way in Unix programs work, they refer to the files open by a number. When you open a file, you get some number for it. It's usually sequential. And all the programs have 0, 1, and 2 for the um, open files, uh, for files that are open for every program. At least at the start of it. The zero refers to a fake file or potentially real file for the keyboard. One is the thing that just comes out to the screen. And two is used for when there's an error. So when there's an error, it can go to another file or fake file that still goes to the screen. Um, And normally that's the normally that's the just the screen. In Bash, you can control where these go. So, for instance, if I type ls and I I ls slash so the root folder, and then I ls something that doesn't exist, you'll get things from the root folder, and you'll get an error message. In Bash, you can control where these go. So one is the standard output, and I can put that in ls list, uh, ls output. I can choose any file name I want, and I could put two in ls errors. And when you do that, two new files are created. If I view ls errors, I get the error message. ls output gets you all the things that were in that, or my root partic my root folder. So bash lets you control these individually. Um, C shell not so much. So the question how you interact with it. How, uh, using your shell to change how you interact with programs. Zero again. So zero is actually the um, input. So zero is usually hooked up to your keyboard. Um, and likewise, for here, I could do zero comes from slash etc slash nano rc and get the same results. It wouldn't make much sense to redirect. I don't actually know what would happen if you redirected zero to a file. Okay, so off doesn't like that. 
trying to write to something that the, um, can only read from. Or reading from something that can only write to. You look confused. Okay. So a common trick here uh, on Unix machines, a lot of the hardware is accessible through the file system. If you ls slash dev, you get access to um, devices on the file system. You'll probably have a lot more than I do. Um, the one I want to point out, ls slash null, is actually a really nice, um, nice device, just basically a dumping grounds. Um, you can inter you can read from it, you can write to it. If you write to it, you just lose whatever you wrote. So that seems very pointless. But let's say I run that command that had the error again. I could send the standard error out there. And it goes to this file that's really a device, that's really a, um, yeah, black hole. Uh, so, this is, so this is one of the uh, useful things about being able to redirect a different file. Um, File descriptors independently. So, if you don't care about errors and they're like filling up your screen as something runs. Okay. So probably the most useful um, kind of redirection you can do, and this is something that Windows even cop or DOS even copied the syntax for is that, as I, as I did it on here, you can take the standard output from one command and make it the standard input for another. So for instance, I'm going to type ps, which for me shows very little. This, this shows processes that are running um, in my user, kind of in the same um, login sense. Um, so if you're running terminal, if you're running a terminal on um, if you're running a terminal on Linux on top of a GUI, it'll probably show just the processes that you started in that terminal. Uh, I don't know on a Mac how much it shows. But it shows some small amount of the programs you're running. Here at the time it was run, I'm bashing the um, PS command itself. That was all. That all went to the standard output. I could take that and bring it through off, and this will probably make more sense. I'm grabbing the second column now of another command, just to go a little more dramatic. PSAUX. Um, is what I use to get every command that's running on the computer. Here I'm using kind of a contained environment, so there's not much, but you'll probably have a lot more on your computers. Especially if you're on Astro One. Rick is usually running Firefox for some reason. Um, so you see the programs and details about them and some lies about how much memory they're using. Um, <laughs> And then, so you can use awk to get certain columns of this. Let's say I want, um, let's say I want the last column. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Okay. Yeah. And then I want things that have system D in it. So grep is another command that I didn't have time last time. That's also that was on the cheat sheet at the end last time. That allows you to do a search. 
a very general kind of search. Um, because the way you do the query is a language called regular expressions. Um, but if you just type regular regular letters, it'll just search for this, the things that have those letters in them. So you can see I'm using a program to list all the processes, the program to just get their names, the last column, their names and how they were run. And I'm searching through that list. So this is something that you do in Unix a lot, and Linux a lot. Um, use the input of one program, or the output of one program as the input for another. Um, and if I wanted to, I could send it all to less. So almost every command, and less is right here, there's not much I can do with it. I could search, if you would help, but yeah. Um, yeah. So almost any command that takes a file can take a um, can also take standard input, which means any command that takes a file, almost any you could actually type it in the command line. Um, what you want it to do, or what you want it to work with. So any questions about this? Or what questions do people have? So one thing I like to do, du tells you, um, du counts up how much memory each, uh, each file and folder is taking up. In this case, everything's just about empty. So if we go to slash etc, do du. You see some of them I don't have permission, we'll talk about that next time. And some of them have small small sizes, human readable sizes with dash H. It may not work on a Mac. Um, but one thing I, I like to do is take that output, sort it based on human readable um, file sizes, and then Print the second column, and then use the head command to just get the top ten. And this, these are the top ten, um, well, top ten folders in terms of size in this directory. So if you think of what you want to do and just run it through each of the steps to do it, um, you can really get complicated commands. And build your build your own commands like Legos. I don't know how much of this works on a Mac because I don't know if you can do the sorting by human readable um, human readable sizes. Did my different No. So the alternative. Actually, I guess the alternative would just be to use the normal byte size because you're not displaying how much it is. Um, basically data that a program has and that other uh, programs basically inherit when they start. So in Bash, in, in Bash, the um, environmental variables control things like what this prompt looks like, what colors it has, 
what information it shows. Um, they control things like what program, oh, what options less will have by default, what options other programs will have by default. When I run, not in this, but in my normal terminal, when I run a program like gedit, which is a graphic text editor, that's very bright, but um, I don't use gedit, so I'm not going to bother changing the <laughs> color scheme. Um, what computer it should start up on? Powerful concept. But that is told in the environmental variables that um, that this get that gedit gets when it starts, gets from the shell. So to see your environmental variables, it's export in um, bash our born shell compatible shells. And you see kind of a mess of stuff. You see where my mail folder is, if I had a uh, mail server on here. Um, not that. You see what colors LS uses in some weird format that, I don't know how the colors are specified, but this actually tells you how it chooses what has what color. Um, and it can tell you how to make sense of that. And a couple other things that are useful for programs to know, like uh, what kind of terminal I have, how many times I've run, sh uh, run shells. Um, so, an example of an important one, and I use the echo command, which is really simple. The echo just prints out whatever you give it. Say echo high there, it gives me high there. Bash and C shell, if you want to use an environmental variable, you use a dollar sign. And if you want to use the environmental variable in command, you use a dollar sign um, to replace an environmental variable with its, path, with its name. So this is what the path has. Set for it. And if I do PWD, which from last time, this is the um, current directory, shows that. If I wanted, I am in PWD with a username of user. It's, it's, it's not, the echo command isn't reading this stuff. Um, the bash is replacing what you put with the dollar sign with the actual, um, wherever the environment's variable set to. So this doesn't have it. But my, my everyday shell, go down one, a couple, there's quite a bit more. Clean how to look at Java, how to talk to other processes, the files to protect when I update. Um, so I use the lot for inner process communication. The path file is one that I want to talk about. It's an important one that you probably have to change when you install um, programs that aren't installed very nicely, which aka a lot of science programs. They're programs from scientists who don't know how to program or distribute software. So the path variable, um, when you type a command, let's say I type command. Oh, that actually did something. Let's say I type command one. <coughs> I have no idea what command does. But <laughs> <laughs> so there are Linux, yeah, there are Unix commands that I don't know. You can check the man page. So command one, um, the way Bash says it doesn't know where to find it, it checks every folder in path. Um, this is a colon separated list. It checks them in order, and the first one it finds it uses. So for instance, if I do which ls, 
thousand slash bin slash ls. If I do which, um, oh yeah, cal say it's in slash user slash games. Cal say does this. So <laughs> Linux uses commands for spider thing. Um, yeah. Oh, you probably don't have cal say. <laughs> that that does not come with. Like situation somewhere. I can install it. <laughs> yes. So if you are running like if you are running you uh, Debian or Ubuntu or Linux Mint, you can do that. But um, you can yeah. Or ask Rick if this is and claim this is really vital for your research. <laughs> So, so path is key for getting things to know where your um, where your programs are. Let's say. So this is my home directory again. Let's say I'm going to make make some programs that are useful for myself, uh, or I'm going to download one-off scripts. What I do is I make a file called bit or a folder called bin. Call it anything you want. And I set my path, well, this is just repeating. I set my path to be the same thing, but with the path to the folder I want to use. So the way to do this in Bash is to do export the name of the variable and then what you want it set to. In my case, this. And then if I echo path again, and I'm pressing the up arrow to go backwards through the commands I've typed. Um, if I echo path, you can see that the folder I chose is on there. And now, let's say I go in here, I create a folder, or I create a, actually, let's copy something. Let's say the file command. Okay, let's try the find mount command, which does a, is a Linux only thing, so not that. Um, let's say the file commands, and we'll give it a new name. My own file. Okay? So in my, um, home directory slash bin, I have my own file. Path is set to have that folder at the very end. And if I type this, I get, well, the same thing you get when you type file alone. Just it knows the name changed. And I could actually run this on itself. And it works. The file tells you what kind of file you're looking at. As I mentioned last time. So, what questions do people have about paths? I don't know if people are familiar with um, DOS. In DOS, you can just type something and it'll search the directory you're in. Unix actually takes the security seriously. Um, so that does not work. It's not just choosing a command from the same directory. So it should never do that. similar um, in C shell. So if you have to use C shell, if your burns are required, you can still set your um, variables in there. And as you can see, it got the same path from bash that I just ran it in. So 
can exit out of seashell. I think Astro One has seashell. Um, the astronomers need it. Okay. Yeah. So the next trip, the next like really useful thing that um, can make your life a lot easier are aliases. So alias allows you to say, uh, I don't know, eject cup holder, and that's the same thing as running the eject command on your CD drive. And if you do this, it'll probably tell me I don't have the eject command. But still, the, um, or let me go up where I ran that du command and sorted everything. So one thing to do, something really complicated like this, and this is actually fairly simple. Um, it, what mine does is I actually um, display the play both of them um, and sort in a way that doesn't repeat itself. But anyways, I could call this whole long thing something short and simple. And since everything's basically empty, it doesn't matter. Although actually, why you should test things. So I was using an alpha, uh, uh, alphabetical sort instead of a numeric sort. But that doesn't change that I can now just type dux and get this long, uh, longish command. Some criteria that like you can only hold five plus or minus two items in your head. Like, really focus on. More than that, you're going to forget them. Um, so this is a really good way of getting around that. One way, so something useful to those of you on Macs, you could make ls be an alias for ls dash capital G to get color. This is not something you want to do on Linux because dash capital G does something different. So, on that, you can do this. If I just type alias ls, it actually tells me that I already have an alias for ls for my Linux distribution. Hey, Joseph. Yeah? If I want to reset an alias to do what it, like, for the ls command, if I wanted to revert that back to normal. So there is an unalias command. I don't know the equivalent in C shell. Um, this is for number of this. This. Yes, this is only for this session. And yeah, there's no alias for LS. Uh, and if I type LS now, yeah. so it's only for the set for the current running shell. Um, so um, when I restart my computer, it won't remember these aliases. Right. So how would I make that permanent? So that next thing we talk about. But, yeah. but actually, let's have a slide on that. So you can make it permanent by putting into a file that your shell loads. So you put the alias command, you can put the export command for variables that you want, you can put any other command you want. Um, you can have a command that starts up other programs that you want, um, like a, a program in the background for playing music. If you want that running while you log in. Which sounds funny, but um, there are people who do that, and then they control it with commands once they're in. Um, so, the to figure out what files to put it in, depends on how you start a shell. 
Uh, these are kind of kind of pointless details um, that Bash makes us go through. To be honest, to point the blame where it should be. It matters whether or not you're running a program that uses Bash or your or C shell, or if you're running it to run commands. It also matters whether or not you logged in with it. In C shell and TC in TCSH, um, however you start it, it'll read your TCSHRC if that exists. Otherwise, it'll read that CSHRC. So you could put commands to start up, or put commands that you want in every shell in there. Uh, it also reads this extra file for a login. You can imagine um, that you don't want that you would want your um, your mail checked right when you log in, and then you do that yourself. Um, so and then you do that yourself later, so you don't need to create a um, you don't need to have that every time you open a shell. So you can ima imagine having some things happen just when you log in. Bash kind of goes along that direction. If you log in, it loads one of these three files, uh, depending which one it sees first. That profile is from the original born shell, so it's kind of a legacy thing that it ignores if you have a dash, dot, dash, or a dot, bash underscore profile. And if you're not a login shell, and you're interactive, it reads bash rc. So your daily body made you hope to be using this? So what you do in daily is ignore these differences. Put this in your dot bash profile to read dot bash rc. The dot reads that file in a very concise notation. And you just put everything you want in bash rc. All the Linux distributions will do this, Macs do not. And in Macs, they treat, um, when you open up terminal.app, they treat it as a login shell. And so they ignore bash rc. And most Linux, people who use Linux will use bash rc. So, in any well configured system, this will be in your dot bash profile, and you'll be able to just put everything in dot bash rc. So that is the short answer to how you make this permanent, or the kind of long-winded answer. If you already have the, um, yeah. I'm going to use nano. In one of these files, if you already have something like this, where you're reading .bash rc, which all Linux, Linux distributions should have. Macs don't, unfortunately. You can just edit .bash rc. In my case, Debian puts a lot of stuff in here, a lot of comments. Um, but I can skip all this and see a bunch of aliases are set. Here's why I have colors. Um, and some ones that you could un uncomment for other colors. Useful aliases, there's a file that it'll um, do for aliases. Just, just aliases if you want to make it. You don't have to. You can put this in there if you have Linux. This in there if you have a Mac. One thing that's really nice, you could do this, which makes RM ask you before it deletes anything. Or this, which makes RM ask you before it deletes anything and tells you what it's doing. Likewise, for any of the other commands that could override your own files that are commonly used. So now, and let's say do work 
and this is some command that sees and the um, isn't it? Isn't that into my my work directory. Oh, actually, I run some command in my research directory with some options. So, whatever is useful to you. It's quite a bit. Personally, I have a handful. No, I don't. Actually, I think I have to put them in another file. But, so, I have the file to get the uh, log to log in to my router and get using another script and get the um, log file from that or view it in a scrolling window. Um, I have things to look at the files shared with my group. I have so, something for loading Python easily. Something for making see if seeing if my graphics are working well. Um, and you can accumulate stuff. It saves your um, saves you having to figure out over and over what the command or what or what um, well, options you need for your work. Well, One thing useful: if you actually do figure how to run Emacs in a um, Emacs graphically, I think on on a Mac. There's something here that you could do. I'm not sure what the path was for Emacs on the Mac to run it graphically, but something like this. Once you figure that out, you can make it into an alias. Or, if you never want a graphical, the NW. Use that are new to this stuff. This is um. Try to think of what you're going to be using often. You're going to want shorter aliases for. Um, but it is a really useful. But things won't work right off the bat when you save this file. What do you have to do to make things implement these things? Good point. It loads it when it's, it loads it when it starts. Which means that. Which means that if I did do work, it doesn't know what I'm talking about. If I start bash again, it'll read the file. And then it knows what I'm talking about. The command doesn't exist, but stuff. If you want to, so you can start up again, you can log out, log back in. Um, the alternative is the thing in that little snippet to put in bash profile, the dot file, or sorry, the dot command or reload, any file you choose. So if I do this, then the current shell knows. Dot is actually a shortcut for source. So dot and source do the same thing in bash. But, the, but those just load a file in so you can use the aliases and um, environmental variables to find, as well as functions, which I'm not going to talk about. But functions allow you to do um, yeah, fancy things that I don't have permission to read much of this. But my top 10 files thing is actually implemented as a function that does a lot of stuff and then goes through this long thing. So you can do some nice scripting. Um, to do commands that you feel like should be there, but you can piece together other commands to make them. So. Yeah. Any questions?
So the other things, some things I didn't really cover the um, last time. You can press page up and page down to go through uh, previous commands. Or not, not page up, page down. Page, um, the arrow keys on your keyboard. You can also use Emacs key bindings. So if you're familiar with the keys that you use in Emacs, if you open it up and go through the tutorial, I think by going here and pressing enter, um, you can use those keys. Bash also supports um, Vim, uh, using it like Vim, if you'd like. There are lots of uh, shortcuts for going through and Say, uh, going back and forth through the command line is really nice for when you have really long commands, like uh, just, uh, having multiple commands piped together. And Control C is a universal stop. Uh, it ends the terminal you're at. So I type Control C, and it ends the program. So, won't stop on its own. And the only other major, really major thing about using the shell regularly um, that's useful is a concept called wildcards. So let's say I look in my slash lib. Everyone should look in their slash lib. I'm sure there's a ton more files here. You see, um, I don't know. On Max, I think you would see dot, do you see dot SO on a Mac files? There's probably a lot more files. So Let's say I wanted. Let's say I wanted to run ls on every file in here that begin with lib. I can type ls liv. If I press tab twice, I see all the options. But if I really want to run this command, the asterisk lets me say that I any. Um, any way there is to complete the name is fine. I can use this throughout the file. So anything that begins with an L and any number of characters, I don't care what they are, and ends with a dot so dot zero. And I just get three files or four files. So the, the star is the main wild card. So you what this is actually doing, and I call this echo to show that this is the shell doing it. Um, is the shell is replacing anything with a anything with a wild card to the files that um, match that. So ls is literally getting four things to it, and Echo is getting four things to it. Um, another one, the question mark is any single character, whereas asterisk is any number of them. For the find command also, if I want to find any file that starts with lib, and has a dot so in it. Don't know if I'm fine. So I said control C and fix my quotes. So both the shell and find take wild cards. Find kind of applies them to anything um, that it sees in that folder. So there are a handful of others. I don't know how many of them work for Seashell um, that are useful. The um, 
And some of the, the brackets and curly brackets included. So if you use these in a command, you have to quote them to make sure that bash or your shell doesn't treat that as a wildcard and try to get um try to see if any files match whatever condition you I know you may probably unknowingly use. And heaven help you if there's if you're working with a file that has those in the name of it. You can still do that. Take some making sure the file the shell doesn't treat that special. So, any questions? Okay. Well, I have a little thing, a little thing, the final trick. If you want to take the command you just did um, and put it in the command you're writing, the explanation mark allows you to go back to your history. So explanation mark, explanation mark does the entire line. So, and my shell is set up to display what it does when it does a substitution. Yours may not be. So, I ran this command, and then the shell replaced it with this, and then ran that. So if I run another, if I run another command, I could do expression mark, expression mark to do the command again. And let's say I want a long list. So I'm running that same command with the dash L. And it does that. And when I press the up arrow, my shell fills in what that actually um, was turned into. Uh, so this is good when you're repeating yourself or when you're repeating yourself adding more arguments. Or when you're repeating yourself and deciding to pipe it to another program. There are a lot of other um, history substitution commands. So for instance, if I wanted to do slash, um, slash lib instead of slash boot, I can use these carrots. Um, and I put on, uh, on the cheat sheets. But my point is that there's a lot of, there's a lot of tricks in bash that's worth um, taking some time away. Even though you don't need to use them. Um, just little, um, a lot more nice things, particularly for people who are lazy and want to type as little as possible. Um, you just got to get in that mindset of that there's probably a way to do this very um, concisely. Explanation. So this was the command I typed before. Double exclamation does that command again in this line. It would be equal and then double exclamation. Wait, equal this? E C H O equal. Oh, echo. Echo. Oh, so it actually says what it does. It it takes that whole command and this echo in front of it. So it does echo all this stuff and then pipes it to less. So less is displaying the one line that was echoed. Okay. Did it do something different for you? It actually, um, yeah, there's quite a bit more it does 
this goes, uh, the explanation mark is a lot of wrong. Yeah, the, there's a lot of things for gra grabbing history. Um, so remember, partly a goal to yeah. command line, be as lazy as possible. When you're doing something for the complicated, maybe a simple way, if there's not, make it an alias, make it a script. So, 